but let's be honest, no one really knows what's going on. Our days have been blurring together. The feeling of wasting my time now takes up five hours as opposed to the three hours of my day that it was before. And from the comfort of my own apartment, equipped only with the New York Times, it seems like the entire economy is at risk and not just my grandparents' lives. It's undeniable that crisis changes us. From the way we shake hands to a harsh economic reset that forces us to ask the question, what jobs are actually essential? These are profound changes, and over the next couple of weeks, Room for Discussion is going to talk with people much smarter than ourselves to try and get an idea of how the future may look like, and so that we don't need to read 20 articles to get the answer that it's going to be radically different. My name is James, and today we will, with Elmer, we'll be interviewing Simon Mayer, an ecological economist who has written on the four potential futures that can arrive because of COVID-19. Robust state capitalism, radical socialism, society based on mutual aid and barbarism. Before we talk about this, though, we're going to lead you through it and we're going to talk about what work is for and how the coronavirus is, is going to change work looking into the future. So we got a pretty good answer before, <laughs> uh, but we're going to just keep uh, repeat it for the audience. What do you actually think work is for before we start talking about whether it's essential, how it will change, vice versa? So I, I think there are two sides to work, at least at least in society as it is now. So there's the way that I think most people primarily experience work, which is as a means to get an income, right? So it's the way that you get the money you need to buy uh, the stuff you want. So uh, get bits, food, pay your rent, pay your mortgage, whatever it is. And that's, I think, the form of work which is dominant in kind of uh, in a capitalist economy, that's like the capitalist side of work, if you like. But I do think there's, a, there's another side to work, which I think a lot of us are familiar with, a lot of us want to, to kind of experience, which is workers like contributing to society, helping to reproduce society. This idea of work as like a vocation, so something that you you do to make the world a better place. And I think that's a, a lot of that is about a broader conception of work. So it includes things that you do outside of the market and just any way that you kind of interact with the world. And uh, you've talked before about this conception of work as art. And is this, is this more of the, the second type of work that you, you just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually, so that's um, the idea of work, of work as art comes from uh, William Morris's writing. Mm -hmm. He was... Um, news from Nowhere. The, uh, yeah, News from Nowhere. He's like a 19th century utopian... Uh, socialist. So, usually nowhere is his kind of socialist utopian vision, but he was also like a political activist, and uh, most people actually will know him more from his work in the arts and crafts movement yeah. rather than like socialism. Yeah, you can still buy his like curtains and cushions. Oh, really? Okay. But um, yeah, but he so he talks about work as be well. He talks about art as being um, this kind of creative, any kind of creative endeavor. And therefore he says, given kind of freedom, any work can be a form of art because you give people freedom, you give them the ability to create something essentially. But when you mention, for instance, the capitalist system, is it implying that there is a part of the system that actually creates useless jobs? Because you do mention that a bit in your article as well. Uh, yes, so I mean, when I'm talking about the when I'm talking about the capitalist system, so I, I'm I'm working specifically with this um, definition of capitalism, which comes from uh, political Marxism. So it's this idea that a capitalist system is one where most people are dependent on the market to meet even their most basic needs, and so. Uh, um, in my analysis, essentially, markets have very specific dynamics. Um, so they are driven by this need to create exchange value, to create monetary value, and to do that uh, above any other priority. Yeah? And so what that drives, I think, is this kind of creation of bullshit jobs, useless jobs. And by useless jobs, I mean jobs which only exist to produce market value which is not the same thing as use value. I think... Such as. Can... <laughs> Such as. Um, I... 
Okay, so so the, the concept of or the, the term bullshit jobs is coined by David Gruber, the yeah, anthropologist, and he kind of says this should be left to democratic processes to decide what a bullshit job is. And I do largely agree, but I will put my neck out and say there are some industries which I think we can say are larger bullshit jobs. Uh, I think the, the advertising industry is a good example. I think it's primary, the primary goal of most advertising is to convince us that the way to be happier is to consume more stuff and therefore go out and buy more stuff. And I think that is essentially based on a lie and therefore most of this industry is based on a lie and it's useless. So on Graber's account, I think he said around 50% of jobs were useless. Do you agree with that figure? Um, I don't know. I mean, in, in a sense... In a sense, I think the, the kind of the, the, the how, what portion of jobs are useless is almost um, maybe kind of misleading, like takes us down down, down the wrong path. Like, so? This is not the right question to ask. It's not, it's not about putting a definite number on how many jobs are useless. It's more the questioning the system that leads to the fact that yeah, we have useless jobs in the first place. Yeah, but, but also, but like, it's not kind of, but I think that kind of implies, that 50% figure kind of implies that, you know, my job is either useless or it's not. And I actually think that like a function of the system is that most jobs have some useless elements and some kind of useful elements. Like, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I'm sure there are a lot of people watching who think that being a kind of ecological economist is a useless job. Um, and I, I, I do think that the work I do has some importance, but because it's embedded in this kind of neoliberal capitalist system, it also has hugely useless functions. Like, so the conversation piece that I wrote, where the, I guess is how you kind of found me, it's the one for for futures. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting example of this because I do think that was something important that I wrote that helped me and hopefully some other people make sense of this crisis. It's not really part of my job description. Like it's it's kind of it's a nice to have, but the really what I what I'm supposed to be doing is putting out these kind of journal papers and getting grants, which ultimately will be read by far, far fewer people and probably do kind of much more mundane and less relevant things but you in order for me to be able to do a bit of a job which i think is important i have to do a bit of a job which i think is not important but not not because i necessarily gain anything from the unimportant bit but because it's how that's how the, the kind of contract of employment works but if then in individual jobs you have parts that are useless and, and parts yeah. that aren't how can you really say or how can graber say that you know, fifty percent of jobs are bullshit jobs. So you can't just put such a blanket statement out there. You've got to have more more nuance about it in respect to the individual job. Yeah, I guess so. And I, I actually, so I read I read Graver's um, essay, Strike Mapping. I haven't read his full book, so I'm not quite familiar with how he kind of derives those figures, right? But he, my my understanding is that in his kind of framework of bullshit jobs, he. Uh, he relies on people to self-identify what a bullshit job is, right? Um, and maybe, and I'm sure there are people who think that my work is completely useless. But even even so, I, I'd be tempted to think that they, you know, they develop skills, they have, they bring something which is is meaningful. It's just identifying what that is. And I think that underlying this kind of idea of bullshit jobs there is the the difference between exchange value and use value. And this is something I think you've written about uh, quite a bit. And yeah, just could you just explain this this difference and how it relates to this conversation we're having about useless jobs? Yeah. So exchange value, uh, at least I'm using, it, is essentially like the uh, the value of something in terms of what you can get for it, what you can swap for it. Yeah. So that, that idea of exchange. Um, and that, that's a terminology which comes from kind of Marxian economics. Uh, a lot of ecological economists prefer to use a, just the term monetary value because that's kind of how it's how most of us would experience exchange value now. Um, so it's essentially just what is something worth on a market? If I produce something, how much would I get if I tried to sell it? Yeah. Um, use value is 
what would I, what do I actually want this for? How am I going to use it? What, what is its purpose? And those two things are not necessarily the same. Uh, it gets, it gets a little complicated. So Marx in particular says there is some relationship between exchange value and use value because otherwise why would anybody buy anything? Why would you exchange it in the first place? But I do think that relationship breaks down at certain points. I, I definitely, yeah, I agree that it's imperfect, but I think the problem you then get is how do you, yeah, how do you kind of come to any sort of objective or intersubjective understanding of the use of a job if you don't have a price for it? And all we have is that exchange value because the use value can be very different in one context compared to another. And so, yeah, we don't really have any kind of grounding to make comparisons or to really kind of yeah be able to understand the world unless we equate exchange value to use value. Yeah, and, and, it, and it gets it gets worse, right? So what a lot of feminists and ecological economists talk about is not just exchange value and use value, but other kinds of value. So talk about like intrinsic value, mm. which is the value something has just by existing, yeah. regardless of whether I want to use it or not. But where I think that takes us is that if there are all these different kinds of value and we don't think that we can equate them all into one value form, which is what price and markets essentially try to do, then we arrive at an explicitly political decision. So we know we're going to be trade-offs between types of value. What I think that calls for us to do is to say, is to actually argue about how these trade-offs happen rather than leave it to some kind of external uh, quasi-objective okay. market. So just, yeah, even the, you know, describing what work is for in the job, it's actually, it's a political conversation in that sense then. And just to kind of, yeah, defer any judgment to uh, a price, a salary or something to, to try and find out any, any use is actually, yeah, it's lazy in that sense. We need to have kind of deeper, more moral discussions about which jobs we actually really value in society, regardless of what they're being paid. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even to try and kind of rethink that, that relationship, like if you want to have a monetary economy, then why is it that jobs that appear now, at least with COVID, to be essential, why is it that they are not um, highly valued in the market? Yeah, so before we move on to the next section about how jobs will change, the assumption is if you're moving away from the high authority, which is the, you know, for instance, value price set by the market, then the other high authority that will come in is that democratic system that Graeber kind of puts out where you can kind of decide collectively which jobs are more valuable, correct? Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, that, well, it, when you say something, that, that is what I would like to see. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure that's the only possible option, but yeah. Yeah, so I think there's two conversations we can have, which is, you know, the kind of more meta discussion about how work will change in general, like Zoom calls like this, but there's also a question of which jobs will change, for instance, which jobs will suddenly be of more value. And of course, right now we're dealing with an externality. So you're seeing, you know, rises in nurses and doctors, the demand for that. But after this, right, after COVID-19 dies down, do you think we'll see this different structuring of jobs and how we value them as well? So I think this brings us on to kind of a, a slightly bigger topic of conversation because, uh, and this is a repeated conversation I'm, I'm having at the moment where there's this question of what, what we think will happen, right? How will things change? And I, I, in a way, I think that is a, quite a dangerous way to, to kind of look at this Why? because I think what, what will happen is a function of what, we do now and whose interests who organizes to make their interests happen so essentially i think what covid has really done and this pandemic has done is open up this kind of new economic space where we can see that actually there are potentially different ways of running things but how you which which forms come into being which different things change which things stay the same very much depends on how we organize and how we respond now like the future is what we make it is, is what i'm saying but do you have a kind of i mean a ballpark estimate of which jobs you think will potentially maybe gain in value that we haven't had now and which will lose for instance like financial intermediaries do you think those might 
be less valued uh, in the coming months? It, so so my, my, dif my difficulty here is like, so, so some jobs you can see that there's going to be political pressure regardless of what happens to um, to keep like, to keep an increased kind of, I don't know, diagnostics testing industry and increased vaccine industry. So you're going to see an increase in those kind of jobs. Something like financial intermediaries, I think is more difficult because they are a very kind of politically powerful, financially powerful group. And unless there are big movements of people who organize to change that power structure, it's hard for me to see politicians going after them. That's not to say I don't think it could happen, like, but it, it really depends on kind of people who are sympathetic to the idea that actually we don't need such a big financial sector, but we could do things differently actually organizing as a political force and doing something about that. Let's uh, take another example, which is that, for instance, if you look at the United States, there's some issues with parents, right, that have their kids staying over at their houses and doing schoolwork. And what they notice is that if it's virtual and, you know, the kid has more agency than usual, the school day becomes 90 minutes as opposed to around eight hours, right? So that begs a question of how that's structured. So things like that, like where you'll see this radically different world with, for instance, schools or the institutions that are in place now, just because we're forced uh, to see that it's actually easier a different way. Well, but it depends what you mean by easier, because... More productive. But if, if, but if we have this kind of... But it's more productive for who? Because if we have this continue of this kind of broadly uh, capitalist system, which is driving towards more and more profits, there's no real incentive there for a school to to shorten its day to 90 minutes even if the kid gets everything the kid needs because the the point of the system is not to provide that child with the most productive efficient form of education and let them play you know what i mean a lot of what we're seeing a lot of discussions are happening is i can't work from home while my kid is kind of here because yep. they're too happy so i think there's an interesting question about whether like if you carry with continue a broadly capitalist economy would schools be kind of allowed to reduce their, their day to 90 minutes because they're kind of functioning as an advanced daycare system yeah i'm thinking about this i just have one more follow-up on it because i understand that there's this kind of idea even if we get more productive there's kind of a paradox because then we just fill in the time even more trying to do productive activities but for instance like the idea that this is the largest experiment of people working home and there are some people that can work much more efficiently ho at home than before, which means that there's a total reduction in time that they're working. And I feel like that does beg the question that, for instance, this experimentation in a three-day weekend suddenly becomes a bit more realistic than before, which is kind of a benefit of the productive system, right? Yeah, I mean, so uh, this actually, it's interesting, this is something that um, William Morris wrote about, like, so 100 years ago which is essentially you have kind of two driving dynamics of um, capitalist markets. One is you want to become more productive, um, which increases your profits, uh, allows you to sell more stuff. But the other way you can increase your profits and sell more stuff is by getting people to work longer hours. So you have these two kind of competing forces. So you can imagine a world where you move to a four-day working week. Um, and a lot of this is kind of that is kind of, but at least in the UK, that was already kind of a bit, there's a bit of momentum around that, the think tanks and stuff kind of pushing this. It was part of Labour Party policy. But a lot of the, the rhetoric around that is you can only move to a four-day week if you become more productive, mm. which to me is kind of problematic. Like pushing people to be more productive and saying, you know, get this same amount of work done in four days is fine it kind of works for people but what if it what about those people it, it doesn't work for um and how are you achieving that productivity i, I can understand that uh, yeah and uh, you've criticized the you know the idea of the axiom of, of productivity and this central goal of always pursuing that and you know there are interesting arguments bring up for for why but if could you just put the you know the motivations of a four day week working week aside and just look at the outcome and say that well the this you know covid 19 has shown that 
you know, through Zoom and through technology, the ch you know, we could have a, a four day working week um, and it could actually, you know, the fact that it could be more productive is irrelevant, but it's it's shown to us that it could be possible. And then that's kind of one step in the direction, at least I see it, of a more dynamic, creative, less monotone, going into the office nine to five, five days a week type of job. The, and this is, you know, going back to the first thing you said about these two different conceptions of the job and whether the, the four day working week, um, you know, is starting to push us more into the, that second conception of, of work and just giving us more freedom and autonomy in how we work. Um, sure. I mean, I think for the groups that that's true, then that's, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem with four day working week kind but of all. Which groups, outside. because you mentioned this before. So which groups do you think will be left out? Well, I mean, I mean, so I can work from home. I mean, I was doing a lot of work from home before it started. Um, you know, my sister who works in a school, she can't work from home. My uh, father-in-law who restores furniture uh, for a charity for a living, he can't work from home. Like, there are large groups in our economy who cannot work from home. And I do think, like, particularly, I do think there's an element of kind of academics and kind of media people kind of hyping this, no. we can all work from home and be more productive in a way which is, kind of forgets that our ability to work from home rests on a lot of people not working from home. You know, I'm, I'm using a computer, I'm sat at a desk. These are all things which are produced in factories where which have to have people present. Yeah, yeah, and there's also it's interesting, and I think we may touch on this later. And yeah, there are if you look at the groups that that can work from home and the groups that can't, and how they you know kind of tie into these broader structural inequalities in in society. Yeah. And you look at yeah the groups that are going to have to to work in a factory or something are going to be more kind of blue collar jobs and people you know lower down on the income scale. And so, yeah, could you see a situation where you have kind of professionals and people in services who can have this great, dynamic, flexible four day working week, you know, from home and then they, you know, have the rest of the time to, to kind of, you know, do, for creative, productive endeavors, however that may be this kind of more utopian vision. But as you said, that relies on broad swathes of people lower down the income scale who are forced to go into a factory and work nine to five. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it's difficult because I'm not sure each of those jobs has, in you know, those class of jobs have their kind of, um, have their challenges, right? And like office-based jobs, not entirely, but largely are kind of better paid than those kind of those factory work mm -hmm. jobs. But equally, there, there's an element of not being able to leave the work at home. And so I'm also kind of skeptical about this idea that we'll move to a four day week and we can work virtually because actually I think the experience of the last 10 years or so has been that the kind of the increase in tech and autonomy in work has, it has pushed a lot of occupations to work on weekends and work in the evenings, even though they're not actually, they're not officially in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Work kind of continue. The, the line isn't being blurred properly. Yeah. yeah I, I guess the more utopian vision that at least I've read about is that, for instance, the founder of WordPress, one of the founders, who it's completely remote. So they do all their meetings digitally. They might have an in person meeting, you know, occasionally a couple of times per year. But they say that there's a couple of dimensions that make a job good. There's kind of mastery, this ability that you can, you know, go up. Uh, in the latter, but there's also another condition, which is autonomy. Yeah. So the ability that you can control how you work, and it seems quite trivial. But for instance, if you're working from home, for all you know, you could have a scented candle right next to you right now, mm -hmm. and that just makes the experience that much better. Even though it seems quite well, not wearing any trousers or something. Yeah, you exactly. Just roll yeah. out of bed and you know. I won't. I won't stand up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no. It, yeah, and I agree. And like, there's like, so there's lots of stuff on what makes good work and. Um, and sociological frameworks tend to focus on this idea of autonomy. I do think w when we talk about autonomy, for me, what's more interesting is going slightly, slightly kind of deeper, more structural than the idea of, you know, am I wearing trousers? Do I have a scented candle? And it's this question of what is the work actually for? So like, I can have 
all the autonomy in the world in terms of how I set up my workspace at home, maybe what kind of hours I work. But if I'm still producing something which I believe to be essentially pointless, yeah. I, I still right. that, that's not kind of a real autonomy. You know? No, and then and the point you said earlier about how technology is is yeah kind of blurred the lines and pushed the the working week into the the weekend. I guess you could say that if everybody really had a passion for what they were doing and you know they loved uh you know creating whatever they were creating or producing what they're producing then that doesn't actually matter you know the you know you could you don't even have to have five days of work and a two days of weekend uh you don't have to structure your life as work and not work because what you're doing is this kind of social pursuit of you know what you love to do yeah, I mean, that's essentially William Morris's conception of work. That's how his utopian news from nowhere works, is people are constantly worried about there not being enough work for them to do because it's how it's, they see it as this way that they create meaning in the world. But that's, I do think that's very, we have to be clear that that's very different than work as it exists today. Right. I, I do think you, that you need a real system shift to make that view of work kind of a reality. Because there's, there's a saying, you know, it was a saying uh, in English, it's do, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. But there's also kind of a, I heard somebody said to me the other day, you know, do what you love and you'll come to hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah i haven't heard that one before <laughs> that's it no yeah. no well this is yeah maybe the american english cultural divide i think <laughs> yeah, um, yeah no i think that gets to the core of the issue yeah it's 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 i mean how much do you think it's then just a, a matter of kind of attitude towards how it's an attitudinal thing how people view their work you know do they see it as oh i have to get up and go into the office today or is it something they really have a you know a passion for or is that just kind of a, a lie that people tell each other you know is this kind of ideal of having this great passion for your for your job you know that's has there ever been a, a, a period in human history where that's been the case or has work always been crap you know has it always been tough um i, I don't know i don't know i mean the I'm also, I'm, I'm also, I mean, this is, we're getting onto kind of personal philosophy now, I suppose, but I'm, I'm not a believer in the idea that you have to get up every day and be excited about the individual task that you're doing, in as much as, like, a lot of the things I've done in my life that have been worthwhile have been really hard or boring, or, like, at times, you know, they've, they've, they've not, every moment hasn't been fantastic. Mm. But... I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure it's. It's an attitudinal thing. I think what I'm. What I'm driving at is that. Is is really this, this fundamental question of autonomy and freedom? It's, am I choosing to do this, and am I choosing the way I do it, or am I, am I doing it because I have to and for somebody else's goals? And I'm not sure that's about an attitude. I think that passion comes if you really believe in what you're doing, and it can be hard to create that when ultimately you know that you're having to submit to somebody else's kind of uh, vision. And to an extent, I think in a capitalist economy, that flows all the way up to the top. Like I think even kind of CEOs are subject to what they think the market wants. Yep. And therefore, I'm not sure there's anybody who actually manages to obtain that level of autonomy that we're talking about. Well, to, to be fair, I woke up this morning super excited. Uh, to the <laughs> podcast, but uh, yeah, we're gonna. We're a student. I yeah, think we, we can't really. Say not a white collar uh, yeah. job. We're gonna leeway right now yeah. to economics. Big uh, uh, <laughs> transition. So you know, if you went a couple of months back, people were thinking that you know, blue collar jobs, we're gonna see a V-shaped recovery, right? Most jobs uh, in the economy, but it seems more like a bathtub recovery, right? It just keep on going. It doesn't seem to get any better. Do you think that maybe in a year or when this kind of COVID nineteen attitude subsides that we will see a relatively steep recovery or is that a wishful thinking? Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, if we want to go wishful thinking. Um, I would, I would almost want like, so, cause when you're talking about V-shaped recovery, back to recovery, we're really thinking about kind of, um, a GDP market economy, right? Like what happens to that metric? So my wishful thinking is that we kind of almost stop having 
that conversation in the future because we, we come up with these different systems of provisioning which aren't so based on that metric. But leaving my wishful thinking kind of on one side, uh, I, I think it really depends. It's hard for me to see a, a, this kind of V-shaped massive fast bounce back that people are talking about. I mean, people have already... I know UK example best, but I, I think we're kind of similarities across various nations, right? Massive amounts of people have already lost jobs. The UK um, have put in this kind of furlough scheme where the government will pay 80% of wages. Um, that's both for kind of people who are employed and self-employed. Um, that's taken a, quite a while for that money to come through. And so, and there are large groups of people who are not covered by that scheme. So I think it's kind of a bit of wishful thinking to think, but okay, well, we just kind of kept most people on, therefore the economy will be fine. Um, the, the kind of the slightly bigger picture of this is so a lot of my, my work previously has been around kind of global supply chains and the interconnectedness of the global economy. And so one thing I do worry about is what happens when this kind of when the virus really hits the kind of the, the like, and it's already spreading rapidly in India, right? If it, if it hits kind of um, sub-Saharan Africa, where you don't have these kind of big um, robust healthcare systems, I wonder if we start to see really big supply disruptions if you get that kind of nightmare scenario. Well, I think, yeah, there are two aspects that I think on the on the one side, yeah, in the the, the countries where our stuff is being made, they're not going to be able to make it. But then you're also going to have politicians in, you know, the UK, the US, Europe, uh, that are, are not going to want to have such a dependence on these global supply chains. Yeah. And I mean, you, I know you've, you've researched the, the fashion chain um, in particular. And so do you see, yeah, in kind of terms of global su supply chains, a big, a big shift is going to occur? I mean, I, I get the sense, like, you're asking, like, about the, the kind of the, the political side of this, right? Like, do we think that countries will try to become more kind of, um, uh, I don't know how you put it, kind of more independent, more, more able circular, to... Circular. Yeah. Uh, and I actually, I mean, they might try, but I mean, I think that's a really long-term project. Right. Like, for a country like the UK, we're not self-sufficient even in terms of, like, food. For example, we're certainly not self-sufficient in terms of uh, any of our consumer goods. But, so, yeah, I mean, you just mentioned, for instance, if we're looking at the V-shaped recovery, you're hoping that maybe after this, right, that that won't be necessarily the metric that we're using, which is also, I mean, a pretty drastic change in a short amount of time. No, so like you could say the same about this. Yeah, but I, I think yeah, no, absolutely. I suppose what I what I um. I was kind of coming at it from a frame of a politician who wants that V-shaped recovery. Like, I think it's hard for me to see how you get that V-shaped recovery while also kind of restructuring your entire economy to produce all your own stuff. I mean, and in fact, to an, to an extent, if you want like a consumer economy, a high-tech economy, as we've been talking about where you can do Zoom, I'm not sure it's, I mean, it's certainly not possible to be entirely self-sufficient. So I think China produces like 90% of the world's um, rare earth metals, which we need for phones, laptops, mm -hmm. servers. So you might see a scaling back of those supply chains. I can imagine that, but they're certainly not going away. No. And do you also think that you know, right now it's obviously a pretty salient issue, but actually give it you know a couple of years or something and these businesses are going to, are going to, you know, look at the, the numbers and say, well, I can either, you know, outsource this supply chain to China for you know half the price, or I can, you know, have, have it made domestically with the kind of vague, unlikely insurance of if there's a, you know, a pandemic. And I'm not saying that people are going to dismiss this you know, topic, but I do think that after a while, um, yeah, the, the lure of saving costs is, probably going to again you know just start to outweigh this vague notion that there might be a pandemic that we need to ensure ourselves for it, it depends where we go with this question of uh, a 
value and what we want the economy to look like. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. If you keep if you keep an economic structure which basically says we need to produce as much as possible for as little as possible, then that kind of exploiting those kind of uh, wage differences and cost differences is just it's going to be how you want to run your economy because that's the rules of the game. Mm. If you set up a different kind of economic system which prioritizes a different kind of value, then you can imagine more localized supply chains. You can imagine people kind of doing things in different ways for different reasons. But it does, it comes back to what Elmer says, which is that this is a massive economic change. Like we're not talking about, you know, you, that's not on the scale of a few more people working from home. That's on the scale of having entirely different rules of the game. And I think for that to happen, what needs to, to first happen is really, I don't know, it's kind of a cultural shift in, in the sense. And the first step is actually just to ask these questions. And I, I do think that you know, the, the crisis will get people uh, thinking, well, hang on a minute, just taking a step back from, um, you know, what they see around us, the system that they've grown up in. I mean, at university, we, we always see the abbreviation T-I-N-A, which is yeah. Uh, there, yeah, there is no alternative. And I think, yeah, you know, obviously no one can really say what will happen with the future of the economy. Personally, yeah, I don't envisage a, a massive change in how we choose to produce things and what we value um, regarding you know, what we produce. But I do think that people will start to have that kind of TINA mindset kind of broken down a little bit and at least start asking the questions, which I guess is yeah something that, you know, that, then it's your job to really capitalize on that, um, if you pardon the pun, to yeah try and kind of get people thinking more about how actually that doesn't have to be like that and um, don't you know, rest on basic assumptions. Yeah, so do you know, um, so you come across this, this idea of capitalist realism by uh, Mark Fisher? No, yeah. no, explain it, to, explain it to me. So essentially, capitalist realism is this idea that um, we have this kind of, as a society, we have this kind of collective inability to imagine social structures outside of capitalism. Hmm. Yeah. And actually, one of the things COVID has done, I think, is, as you've said, is kind of break that capitalist realism. It's, it's broken this idea that the way things have been for the past 40 years is the way they they have to be. It's the only stable economic system. What's kind of challenging for me is that actually the last kind of couple of years, a lot of my work has been motivated by trying to kind of pierce that veil, I suppose, to set, to kind of name this system that we live in, to name it as capitalism and say, look, this is what it is, this is how it works, can we imagine something else? And then for my, I mean, for lots of personal challenges come with COVID, one that's relevant to my work is almost overnight, it felt like with a shift in the tone of the debate, all of a sudden everybody was going, actually, yeah, no, maybe we can do things differently, but what does differently look like? Mm. people like me suddenly find themselves kind of caught short because for, for ages I've been right. pushing doing, think about doing it differently and everybody goes yeah great idea so what do we do differently <laughs> oh I wasn't expecting this yeah. right no, that's, that's perfect because we, we do want to kind of lay out your four futures right now and if you could just keep going just to find those different positions oh. yeah so yeah so, so this is this that's article where, where they have four futures was like I take this, um, it's a technique from future studies. It was actually, I think, either developed or first popularized by Shell, um, who did like these big future planning exercises. Um, and so what you do is you take kind of two factors that you think will be important in determining the future, and then you take extremes of the two factors. So you end up with like this grid with four scenarios on it. And so in the article, I take... Um, the thing we've talked about most here, which is a question of value. So do we, is a kind of guiding principle of our economy, is it market value, you know, producing monetary value, or is it something else? Is it the protection of life, let's say. Uh, so that's one axis. And then the other axis is where the response comes from. So is it highly centralized from the state, or is it highly decentralized, which could either be, you know, lots of, um, 
lots of businesses in a market, or it could be kind of lots of individual community groups outside of the market. Uh, and that's taking those extremes. That's where you get those four futures you mentioned earlier on, James. So it's um, if we are highly centralized, so it's a state led response, but we're still prioritizing market value, then that's what I call state capitalism. And it's a kind of, I think broadly the response we're seeing now. So I think a lot of the kind of interventions that governments have made, uh, so things like a furlough scheme, paying people not to go to work, um, kind of massively increasing credit available to businesses, they're really big changes in how the state kind of positions itself with the economy. It's much more interventionist. But the same, the basic principle of it is to keep those businesses running and to keep the kind of the market operating as much as possible, like the same as it has. If we, so, um, so that's state capitalism. The next one is, is kind of the scariest, I think, which is this barbarism. So it's, again, it's decentralized, uh, sorry, so it's, it's keeping market value as a guiding principle of the economy, but the response is much more decentralized. So this is like a stepping back of the state, a state going but is that, either, is that, is that what sorry? We, is that where we are now? I mean, the kind of people would say they live in a decentralized market economy. Yeah, no, I mean, um, or is it I, would extreme? What, I would see what we're say what we're actually seeing is more of a kind of state capitalist. Response. Sorry, I mean, I, I phrase that badly. When I say now, I mean, not the, the Corona <clears throat> crisis. I mean, before that, you know, the, the past 20, 30 years of you know, neoliberalism uh, and yes, yes, broadly. Um, it's it's not strictly true because like the neoliberalism basically is um, the key role of the state is to kind of create markets and expand. Right. So, so there is a role for that central government, yeah. but broadly, yes, like the idea is that the government creates markets and then leaves those kind of distributed actors to, to run things. Mm. Um, and so if you, I think if you kind of operate on that principle, then COVID looks kind of frankly like terrifying right because we know that businesses are failing markets are really struggling especially if governments don't intervene and i think what you would see is lots of people kind of locked out of um kind of basic provisioning systems um i'm not it's hard to say how much we're seeing that there were a couple of reports which really worried me like a, a week or so ago from italy where in southern italy people uh, hadn't received sufficient support from the government, couldn't work, and were uh, reported to be kind of going to supermarkets and stealing food. Which, to be clear, I'm not not condemning the people who stole the food. I'm saying that's the kind of thing you might expect yeah. to see mm. if um, if like government kind of steps back entirely. Um, and like, there are t I think there are two ways you get to that. One is kind of governments just not stepping in enough, and then kind of being unable to make up the shortfall. And the other is, after the pandemic is largely under control, governments go, well, we have to pay for this. And the way we're going to pay for this is by enacting massive austerity. And therefore, markets and hospitals and healthcare systems failing after the pandemic is actually over. Yeah, this on this part real quick, because there's this kind of paradox with the uh, coronavirus right now, which is that if you take all the necessary measures and governments take the necessary measures, that you have maybe low death rate, low incidences, then everyone will be like, that was all for nothing, you know? Because they're basing it on the numbers they're doing that before, which actually mobilizes reactionary measures against taking more active steps to prevent it in the future, potentially. Uh, yeah, quite quite possibly. It does depend how that kind of conversation works. I mean, so I, I have like quite a few colleagues who work in that kind of science and technology studies area who are desperately trying to point out that this is um, like an example of like a post-normal scientific moment. So essentially the system changes in response to what you're doing and therefore those big death numbers weren't wrong that came out at the start. They just assumed that you wouldn't enact the policies that you have. Mm. And there is a danger with what happened with this rhetoric. Like, do we say, okay, so we took the policy advice and it worked and we minimized those deaths. Or do we say, oh, well, it, it really wasn't that bad. Yeah, right. This, it's this, uh, how, and politics is kind of a, there's a second, 
two orders of chaos. I can't remember who talks about this, but or, or, or something. And the fact that it's reflexive, and so you know, it, it's like the example is I don't know of a, of a, a king and his advisors tell him, you know, there's going to be like a, a massive economic, you know, catastrophe or recession yeah. or something. You need to like store loads of grain or, or something. Yeah. And then they, they act to it and nothing happens. And, you know, the king fires all of his advisors because none of what they told him actually came true and they're terrible advisors. <laughs> um, and it's this kind of, yeah, this idea yeah. of actually by hearing the advice and seeing the numbers and reacting to that you then change the situation so that that original piece of advice is then kind of nullified and looks really off yeah but i I actually don't know how much that will happen here i mean it will depend it will depend a lot on the kind of the the kind of media discourse afterwards i think but um i mean i don't know what what's like what what what's the kind of the the situation where you where you are like what what's the kind of the, the death rates and the hospitalizations like couple of thousands we're doing the swedish model so that essentially means young people kind of i mean it's criminalized now i wouldn't say you mean the netherlands the netherlands criminalizes kind of groups but it's kind of lenient i would say it's it's pretty lenient yeah i mean like uh, i've been calling my parents who live in the uk and trying to explain it to them and actually i sent a photo of this kind of little green area that i i cycle past and uh Yeah. yeah they were pretty shocked actually they were pretty surprised to see the difference but I, I wouldn't necessarily say the Netherlands is quite is, is Sweden. You know, I mean, we still have bars and restaurants and, and cafes closed. It's based on it, but I agree with you. Yeah, it's just a more lenient form. And I think, yeah, once this is kind of passed or at least slightly passed, I think it will be really interesting to see or to try and work out which individual measures had the biggest effect. Um, yeah. Because all of these things were enacted and passed so quickly. And actually, I, I'm not sure whether we have that firm a grasp on the efficacy of closing bars and restaurants compared to um you know not going out outside of your house except for food and exercise and as um yeah and i think there will be kind of an inquiry to see which different measures had the most effect because it's not like the netherlands here numbers are, are shooting up um but if you look around you in the center of amsterdam it's yeah it doesn't feel people. like a, a global pandemic at all it's, it's really yeah, interesting to see. Um, yeah. But yeah, I can't remember. We got to two of the four futures, didn't we? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just, we got sidetracked. But thanks that for last one about, about barbarism, I suppose where I was going was like in the UK, where our death toll is now kind of. Oh, I think we're over ten thousand. Mm. I do think there's a people are kind of looking at those numbers and going, I'm not sure there will be a pushback afterwards i don't think there'll be a pushback and say the policy was too extreme mm. if anything i i mean it depends how long it goes on but if the numbers keep going as they are i think there'll be it's almost as likely that there'll be a pushback to say you did not move early enough why did we wait so long to do this yeah but i guess yeah. but there are two sides to this uh, this equation you have the the case rates the death numbers uh, on one side and then you have the economic damage on the other that's that's the trade-off I guess so you have to look at them both together and you know because saying that you know 12,000 or something people have have died from corona um, in the UK obviously that's that's awful but then you people will have to judge that against um, something else and I you know and in this situation I think it would be you know if the economic damage is so severe that for the next two years we've kind of crippled our economy, then I don't know, I could I think that people would yeah, start to evaluate those corona figures in a different light. I, I'm not sure. Um, certainly some some people will and there is there's an element of that already. Like um, you see kind of kind of leading right wing commentators yeah. that are already making that argument, right? For me it is this question of how bad the economic situation is afterwards is really a question of the policies that are put in place to support people like we live in a system where if you have a recession that is a terrible terrible thing Mm, mm. but it does not have to be simply being out of work does not have to mean that you are living hand to mouth and struggling to kind of pay rent and make uh, and buy your food but that is a reality as it is now. But you right. can imagine governments putting systems in place which make 
which kind of largely kind of removed that, that threat. Yeah, and I, but I do think, you know, we've seen that, you know, definitely the government response has leaned towards that side. And, you know, this talk, of, I think that, yeah, this has kind of initiated the start of UBI. Uh, UBI yeah, yeah. And I really think that could come in in the next five, ten years. And so, yeah, this kind of the delinking of, of production and consumption of, of work mm -hmm. and being able to live which you've written about definitely I can yeah as you said though these are all they're all different paths and you can all see them you know they're all possible that's why we're talking about them but it's really hard to be able to say actually what you know to give have any certainty in saying what will happen this is also quite peculiar because you mentioned that right-wing leaders are kind of hinging against uh, these act uh, I guess policy proposals by certain people but if you look at the United States it's particularly polarized right now between right mm -hmm. and left approaches uh, to COVID-19, I'm sure the same in the UK, which begs the question on how the reaction will be, in my view, again, after this subsides, whether right groups will again mobilize uh, in a reactionary measure. But I guess it's too early to tell. It, it's kind of, I mean, I, I, you'll have to correct me if I say anything wrong, because I, I don't know the US situation that well, but there's, it does strike me as an interesting kind of contrast, actually, between the reaction of the UK right and the reaction of the US right at the moment, where the UK right, so like, because Trump, as I understand it now, is kind of starting to talk about getting the economy back to normal, kind of lifting all these lockdown measures. And that is really not part of the UK conversation. Mm. Um, I mean, it's he, always pretty hard to say what he means. And, you know, he'll say one thing one day and yeah. the other the next. The rhetoric changes pretty quickly. But yeah, definitely. Um, but I do... I do think that speaks to actually within when we we've got used to talking about the right and meaning them in a very kind of economically free market neoliberal kind of sense but there is a strain of kind of right-wing conservatism oh, man. oh we've lost him we just lost you first time the entire <laughs> way not bad <laughs> yeah, I, I sorry I was, I was just saying this kind of We've got used to thinking about the the right wing as being kind of very economically liberal, but there is a strain of right wing thinking, like con like this kind of small c conservatism, mm. which is actually not particularly free market oriented. It's very yep. socially right wing, but actually does see a kind of central role for kind of state led provision, for example. Yeah, uh, authoritarian right. Right, right. Yeah, I think there's, and it kind of relates to the discussion on, on consumer capitalism and definitely there's an element of right wing, uh, you know, small C conservatives who will, yeah, not think that consumption is the path to a better self and that we need to prioritize other other values. Um, so you're right, definitely we, you know, we need to kind of be clearer in our uh, in our language than just saying, you know, the right in a broad sense of, of the term. Um, okay, that's, that's the second time we got distracted, but we, we got state capitalism, we got barbarism, and it does, now the third one. It does it does lead quite nicely, actually, because so the other two scenarios are um, essentially like the, the flipping of that value question, mm. basically, kind of what we've just been talking about. Um, and so the, the third scenario is um, we choose something other than um, market value as a guiding principle of the economy. Uh, and in particular, uh, I talk about this being the protection of life. Uh, and so if you have a centralized response, which aims to protect life above all else, that's what I've called state socialism. And I think that the way I kind of characterize that is the kind of the expansion of the things that the support measures that we're seeing now. Um, so there's kind of this I guess, quantitative and qualitative shift. So you, you see people being paid not to go to work, but that operates in a slightly different way. So in the UK at the moment, you're paid not to go to work, but the way that the mechanics of that work are your employer applies for some money, which they then pay to you. And it's based on what your wage was, how much your employer thought your market value was before this all kicked off. Yeah. The way that works at the moment, it very much kind of reinforces that kind of wage relation. Mm. Reinforces the idea that your value, how much you deserve to earn, is based on your kind of market value. 
under a kind of more um, socialist response, it could be kind of done, it could be done in like a couple of different ways. So it could be more like a universal basic income, like you've mentioned. So you get a certain amount of money and you get it essentially because you're alive and you deserve to be able to live. Or it could be done on some other value metric. So we could say, oh, well, actually, you know, nurses and doctors, we, we think they're the most valuable people, therefore they get the most money. It's, it's just a kind of fundamentally different guiding principle. Mm. Then the final um, future is same guiding principle, so protection of life, but a decentralized response. And so this is um, this is really about a decentralized a decentralized economy, slightly different than we would think about it now. So rather than there being kind of lots of businesses, lots of companies, you would have kind of lots of different community organizations. So these are um, like voluntary groups that come together and they operate some kind of economic production, but they do it for reasons other than to make money, basically. And so this is most similar to kind of William Morris and what we talked about in this utopic vision. This is this yeah, part. essentially, it's kind of um, so Morris uh, Morris calls his vision like a communist society, so that, but it's communism after the state is kind of withered away. Yeah, yeah, anarcho communism. Yeah. yeah. And so what you get is you can you can kind of see the roots of this now, but they're all very small scale. Mm. You know, like so these kind of mutual aid groups which mm. pop up and they're doing like um making sure that people get the people who are isolating get deliveries of groceries. Mm. And and so those kind of tendencies are there. But for this scenario to come true, you have to you have to be able to imagine that it could scale. Mm, right. You could run an entire economy that way. But this this is also kind of a fundamental part of of conservative thought as well yeah. this kind of you know mutual aid exactly. and voluntary associations um yeah. you know helping and having a moral society but in a decentralized it's part of the same team almost a bit yeah it, and it's bizarre. it's weird how yeah these kind of ideas and these implications do really cross over these you know broad ideologies um that we have and so then in your in your four futures our first question was yeah what is work for and then, you know, what is it, this conception of, of labor? And in each of these four futures, I'm say, I say that, um, at least my impression is that in the first two, or maybe three, the conception of work stays the same. It's still, you know, because even with UBI, for example, you can say that, you know, you're a human life and we value that, here's some money, but you're still, working within a capitalist system that you're still kind of you know you have specialized division of labor and you still have a, a job um yeah and it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting this there was um feminist marxist author called kathy weeks who argues for um a universal basic income with what she calls a utopian demand and her idea is that actually it's utopian demand in as much as it's a system you can imagine working under capitalism, and it seems realistic enough that you get it implemented. But she thinks if you gave everybody a universal basic income, you would break the capitalist system. Because essentially, if, as long as it's universal, you would free people up from having to go to work, and people would essentially just stop. And a big enough chunk of people would just stop going to work and would do something differently, but you would actually force the economy to change. Right. And this actually, yeah, relates to... A question that I wanted to ask when reading kind of your your yeah. work on utopian fiction and what we can learn from that and for me the problem is that you can have this kind of utopian ideal but if you try and get there incrementally you're still operating within for in this example like a capitalist paradigm so if you start if you had this kind of anarcho-communist ideal you can and you in a capitalist system at the moment, you can implement different policy measures like UBI, for example, that clearly are pushing you towards that direction. But then the effects of those policy policy measures within that system are going to be so severe that you actually never even get close to, to utopia. It's almost like you have to do it in one big swoop, and that That's just seems. Communism, man. <laughs> but I, and it just, yeah, the the problem I'm trying to raise. So trying to do it step by step just is never going to to work because you know you get markets crashing, and as you said. A recession, people having a job 
doesn't have to be bad. It's just because of the system we have. But then it's going to be so bad within the system we have, and there's going to be such a backlash that you're never really going to get there in the in this utopic vision in, in the end. Yeah, quite possibly. I don't have a ready answer for how we get to the utopia. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, I, don't, I think your point is valid. I mean, and if you, if you read news from nowhere, Morris is, is quite... So Morris was a revolutionary socialist. And he's quite, he has a chapter in News From Nowhere where he talks about how the change came. And he's quite explicit, but it was a violent and bloody revolution. So these, one of the things we, I do think there's things from kind of utopian fiction, utopian ideas, which is kind of inspiring. I also think there are, there are things you know, we want to be slightly critical of. And I don't have a ready answer for how we make a utopian vision come true. But I, I'm not sure the lesson from history is that violent revolution always ends really well. Right. We're just gonna have to wait and see. Um, <laughs> yeah. For a couple of hours, we'll see. We'll yeah, see. yeah. A couple of months or something like that. Um, yeah, I do think we've uh, run out of time. It's been a definitely an insightful conversation. Yeah, really, uh, really, really interesting. Sure. Thank you, Simon. Uh, right. We're gonna continue this conversation for a bit afterwards as well. Right. But, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really all on our end. So we just kind of uh, want to say thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much for, for joining. Really, very welcome, very much. Really appreciate it. So, I guess that's it. Adios. Adios. Goodbye.